Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the voice of combat sport, my good friend, Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? Good, good, Ken. Good to see you and uh, hope you had a good weekend and happy Martin Luther King Day to everybody out there. That's what it is. Uh, it's a holiday today. Of course, this will be up tomorrow on Tuesday, but today is Monday at least in a part of the world that I happen to be inhabiting right now. <laughs> and how about them football games over the weekend, Ken? I don't know if you got a chance to see any of them, but, man, they were they were good. I mean, I think there was one game that wasn't competitive, maybe the 49er game. but That's right. Saturday and Sunday, wow, huge comeback wins. I mean, it's like boxing. If you have a comeback win, it's it's a good fight. You know, if you have, if you have an underdog winning... It's a good show, uh, pr pretty much automatically. How and, about Jacksonville? Down 27 well, nothing at half. Holy yeah, I mean, cow. That was unbelievable. That's one of the greatest comebacks ever. It's one of the top three or four, whatever the heck it is. Um, but you're right, 27 nothing. they come back. And, and then Miami Dolphins yesterday, they were down 17 nothing. Can you believe the Dolphins were even in the game? If you had said to me, I'll give you the, uh, uh, what I don't even know what the line was, but if you said, yeah, Buffalo uh, minus 10, I'd big. be like, give me, a, give me a million on Buffalo. They're going to win the Super Bowl. Yeah, it was, I, a, I it was definitely believe. double figures. You're right. The fact that Miami was even in the game is impressive. Super and, and impressive. And listen, you you happen to know the this, this state where I live, right? It's it's called New York. <laughs> yeah. New York so I was getting yeah. to that. I was like, yeah, can you, you believe the I mean? Giants I mean, are back? Can you, can you put a little, just a little <laughs> love this direction, maybe? The um, Giants are back. As much uh, as I hate the Giants, Jets, Yankees, and every team from New York, I like when they're competitive. Like, the Knicks not being good is a crime against basketball. The Giants not being mm -hmm. good, it sucks for Knicks, football. Knicks it's are great for good. A good. Not as good yeah. as the Celtics, but that's cool. No, no, the Celtics, <laughs> you're right. They're, they're on another level, but uh, somebody's got to make up you know, for that um, golf that was left <laughs> with uh, somebody named the Patriots uh, uh, went went sideways a little bit. Uh, somebody named Brady, who's playing tonight, who oh, who's playing in a big game, game tonight. tonight. I mean, listen, I, I I mean we we can analyze everything, but we know sports. We're, we're not Finn Lombardi's uh, disciples, but you know. We understand sports pretty well. We watch it. We uh, even though combat is our thing, but but Teddy, hold on, hold on. I, I I'll go a step further. You were a coach for the New York Jets. There's well, a million true. sports analysts, broadcasters out there. Unless they played in the NFL or coached in the NFL, you have a better, better, uh, a stronger platform than half the people that are well, out there I would making use a that, living. That term coach for me with the Jets that's a little loose but but yeah I was listed as a coach. You were on the staff right? I was listed as a coach. Okay. If you look in the New York Jets um, uh, media guide for those years three years I was listed as a coach with my picture there but listen, listen again, I appreciate you trying again, to diminish your I appreciate you trying to diminish your reference. role but the New York Jets paid you to be on staff. That's a coach. That's a, like uh, that's if 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 these regular sports broadcasters with all their radio talk shows are on the ten yard line, you're like on the on the other team's ten yard line in terms of knowledge. So I think you're uh, I th I think you're well within your rights to be able to break down. Well, one some thing football. I could think you could say, and I say this, uh, you know, in a sort of a cute way, um, I, I was a head coach. I was a head right. coach. You know, right. but I was I but I wasn't getting paid the salary of the head coach. But I was the head, <laughs> I was the head coach. In other yeah. words, this I was yep. uh, I was uh, the psychological c coach, the uh, coach of the psyche, um, to try to get these guys right when they were going into their dark rooms, uh, find find the switch to put the light on, so to speak, and um, you know to to do mostly that kind of stuff. Um, but I did train them physically too, where we gave him box. I gave him boxing lessons, you know, to help them in footwork. In, uh, yeah, for footwork, for even the punching. Where linemen, a lot of people don't realize the offensive linemen have to punch out. Uh, oh, to for keep sure. The, 
defensive line. <laughs> so the proper way to punch out, of course, not with the fist close, because then we might be uh, seeing a lot of KOs <laughs> on the field. Um, <laughs> hey, you know, I can't say I didn't every once in a while say, hey, listen, just close the fist a little bit and just aim it a little <laughs> under the helmet. helmet uh, and, and maybe you get uh, a real knockout block. But no, the thing about watching the games uh, yesterday was it was great to see the Giants, you know, get back to being in the playoffs. And my son, who really is a football expert, you know, he's been with the NFL for 14 years. He he had told me, he said, I like the Giants, even though Minnesota was, was a favorite and had a great record. He said, I, I like the Giants, Dad. I don't trust the quarterback of Minnesota. I don't trust Cousins. You know, he he's he can be great and he he's very can be very streaky. I don't trust him in a big moment. And of course, the Giants wound up winning. But what really came back to me of my son saying that Ken was the way the game ended. I mean, not for nothing, but you can't end that way. It's fourth down. It's their last chance. They got to get a first down. And I think it was about fourth and eight. And he throws a four-yard pass and gets tackled immediately. Like, how do you do that? I, I, I'm not looking to knock anyone. And obviously, they're, they're the pros, not me. But how do you, how do you throw a four-yard pass when you need eight yards and it's the last play of your season? I would if say you don't this, get Teddy. It. I would say this. It's the same thing when you think about those two guys on the Patriots lateraling the ball in a tied game with no time Under left. Under pressure, the mind, they, the mind short circuits. They jackpot. Were. They know what to do. Cousins is good. He knows oh, what yeah, to do. Is. But when the pressure's on, and, and, and like what you would say, you're in a storm, and can you be calm in an uncalm environment? And, and, and you're... You train your whole life for that split second. And sometimes that split second has happened to all of us. At least it's happened to me. I can't speak for you. But you make a decision. You're like, what the F did I do that for? And I'm sure that Cousins, when I see that happen, I actually have tremendous sympathy, as I did for the Patriots players, where you're just like, oh, oh, you know he didn't want to do that. But his brain was like on autopilot and he made a mistake. And it stinks. I, I I never take pleasure in seeing people make those no, kind of mistakes. No, no, we're not if taking pleasure, wins. but it's just... No, I know you're not. Uh, it's, it's like it mind-boggling to, to, to the average person, you know, to yeah. the layman out there. That uh, It's mind-boggling that you could do that. I'll tell you one thing. Tom Brady ain't doing it tonight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, his brain ain't short-circuited no. in, in, in that situation, and that's what separates him. That, that's why he's that got is seven what, Super Bowl rings. <laughs> no, but that's what separates him. Of course. You know, uh, you could make an argument that Cousins' arm is as good, you know, whether it is or not, you know, more or less. You could say that his accuracy, that his uh, passing abilities, you know, uh, are right there, comparable to, to Brady. Uh, but... It's the mental area. That it's always the mental area in life. In, yeah. in, in my business, in boxing, in, in MMA, in, but in life, because life is a fight. And yep. and like I've said before, and I I should probably get my daughter, who's a lawyer, to <laughs> uh, um, to copyright this phrase. But a fight ain't a fight until there's something to overcome. I mean, that's when, and it's the same thing with life, you know, yep. with whatever you're doing, you're a school teacher, and all of a sudden things go a little, you know, topsy-turvy in the classroom with your, they're not listening, and, and a few other things are going on. Then you're going to find out if you're a teacher, you know, uh, if, if you're a doctor, I've said this before on the Joe Rogan show, and you're, you know, you, you graduated Harvard Medical School, and you open up, and now you open up a uh, a kid to do a procedure that you know how to do it, and then all of a sudden there's an artery uh, that's bleeding that shouldn't be bleeding, and 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 you're reminded that you got kids the same age at home. Now you're gonna find out if you're a doctor. Now you're gonna now <laughs> now there's you, now there's a test to what you are, to what you have proclaimed to be. Yeah, it's one thing to know all the medical books and all the terminologies and, you know, the uh, uh, anatomy of the human being. Yeah, all of that. But then 
when you're there in the trenches, whatever those trenches are, I don't care what they are, whether it's the trenches of, of being in a ring, being in the MMA in the cage, you know, or, or simply being a father, being a parent. And then all of a sudden things go a little sideways at home with your kids and dealing all things that are going to happen, all things that are, that are inevitable, inevitable, because life is a fight. Then you find out, am I really a father? Am I really a husband? Am I really this person? So I, I just thought that I didn't plan on it to be the message for this week, but that's the message for this week is we all have a fight. And um, when that moment comes in our fight, uh, then we find out, you know, exactly where we stand. And, yeah. um, and there's always hope to get better. Remember that. There's always hope to get because there's always another round. There's always another round. Yeah, you lose the round. You lose a couple rounds. But you can go back to the corner. You can get some water. <laughs> you can get some instructions. You can straighten it out, and you could come out after having a few bad rounds, and you could get it right. So yep. anyway, um, it's Love good to it. be with everybody. Let's get to the fights. Um, I've, I've the one last thing about the football is we've yeah, got a yeah, good yeah. one tonight: Dallas and uh, Tampa Bay. And I know Stephen A. Smith is going to be on the Brady bandwagon. Oh, and yeah, uh, yeah. good luck to my friend Eric Decker. His wife is singing the national anthem, Jesse James oh, Decker. Beautiful. Good luck, Jesse James. Um, oh, he was a hell of a receiver for the Patriots. I mean, he was he was the, one of those. De Denver and New York uh, uh, and then National. Oh, De oh, yeah, that's right, Denver. You know why I said the Patriots? Because he reminded me of those Patriot receivers. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I know. You know Welker, what I mean? Amendola, those guys. and Edelman. Yeah. yeah, reliable. They they caught what you threw at them. They got open. They They're weren't quick. the fastest guys, but they were tough and they were dependable. They were they they were there when you needed them to be there. And That's and you right. know what? Those are the most important traits in life. Those yeah. are the most important traits. It's not about how fast you are, how explosive you are. It's about how dependable you are how how reliable you are how consistent you can be it's about all those things um i'll finish with this i was joking earlier about saying we're not disciples of vince lombardi but you know uh we we did sleep in a motel eight um last night <laughs> what, what was that what was that uh, uh, we did sleep in a holiday inn last night though <laughs> you know that that gives us the right to you know to be an nfl coach but I would say this, that the Dallas Cowboys, Tampa Bay has the X factor. You know, yep. they have to, well, they've, they've won before. They have the experience. Uh, and they got Tom Brady, the GOAT. But I would say that if I had to do like Stephen A. Smith's job, the great Stephen A., our friend, who was just on, if you didn't see the interview, people, go and watch. It was only a couple great weeks interview. ago. Just go and watch it. But, By the way, his book is coming out tomorrow, I believe. Yeah, yeah, he's got a great book coming out. And um, I would just say that Dallas is the better team. Really, Ken. Definitely, I, don't I agree. I, I mean, know what you mean. But Dallas I'm putting my money on Tampa. But well, I agree. I, I, Dallas I has, has a better team. The one thing, the other thing I wanted to say is about Minnesota. You know, sometimes you see a team that starts hot. They're like 13 and 2, 12 and 3, whatever the case is. Yeah, they, they, yeah. Won, they had a great record. And my, my middle son is just obsessed with watching football. All he wants to do is talk. He's nine. And he said, oh, Minnesota. Da, da, da. And I don't know why. I just said, I think Minnesota's that they're frauds. I just don't think that that record represents their good. And I'm not trying to be shitty. I'm not trying to be terrible towards Minnesota or towards anyone. But I just, you know, one of those teams you see and you're like, they're not, they're not going. It's like Pittsburgh. When they would make the playoffs 100%. every year, I'm like, I promise you, Pittsburgh's out one win, maybe, but probably for us round, yeah. they're out. And they're just one of those teams where you're like, they don't have it. Like, if you tell me, I, Kansas City, Buffalo, Cincinnati. Something. What you're saying they're, is they're missing some. Right. But those teams like Cincinnati, Kansas City, Buffalo, if I told you any one of those in four weeks was the Super Bowl champ, you'd be like, no yeah, shot. That, yeah. yeah. No, but you could see those teams are like, they have some players that are electric you could depend but on. Minnesota has like one or two guys, like the kid Jefferson, but there's just not enough there. And I don't know. 
I, like, listen, like we, we've I, talked I get about you. before, the last four, six weeks of the NFL to, to show you what the teams are made of. Not the first eight weeks. Everyone's fresh. Everyone's healthy. When guys start going down, coaches have to now play a bigger role. It doesn't matter what pieces are put together. It's like, how's the organization? How do they deal with adversity? Because as, you know, like a fight, you're going to be uh, a different fighter at rounds 11 and 12 than you were in four to six. So... I don't no, know. I just feel- it's not how you start; it's how you finish. Yes, and, and especially no, in the NFL. And you're right, and momentum, all that stuff. But it's also about learning how to win when when the lights are on you, and you know it takes special character, people with character that that comes into play. It's not just athleticism; it's it's those other traits, those other intangibles. And my son, again, to just to finish on what you just said, my son said to me, he said, I think the Giants are going to win because I don't completely trust the quarterback of Minnesota, but I don't trust Minnesota. He said, that team, you know, yeah, they had a great record, a great season, all that, but yeah, they all of a sudden, they will get beat by certain teams, certain ways where they're just, they just come up short in ways where, they shouldn't come up short, and I can't. I just can't depend on them to say that they're going to go far in the playoffs. I don't think they are, and they're missing something. You know, they're just missing something. It's kind of like what I used to make analogy about a fighter who had all the athleticism, all the you know, even technique. You know, they they knew how to fight. They you looked at them; it was beautiful to watch. You say, "Wow, this guy looks like he's going somewhere," and. You know, he hasn't fought anyone to be tested yet, but you look at him and say, he's got everything it takes to be a top fighter. And then I used to say, there's something missing. Yep. It's kind of, And the analogy I used to make was, it's kind of like having a beautiful piece of cake where the cake is beautiful. I mean, you yeah. know, it comes yeah. out of the <laughs> oven and, and it, it rolls up and it, it, it's got the glean on it. It's, it's just brown enough. It's just, it just cooked. It was baked perfect. And you're looking at it, you almost hate to cut it open. I mean, and it looks so perfect. And then you can't wait to get a piece of it. And you cut it open, you get a piece of it, and it's just missing something. Yep. It's just... Just missing something that's spice. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good. That's a good analogy. That's exactly right. Oh, you see those desserts in the deli sometimes, and I'm like, "Ooh, that looks so good." And you eat it, and you're like, "What the hell?" What like just what you say? You're like, "Is this like not enough sugar or something?" It's just like bland. But I tell you, finish on this. The Cowboys, they have a way, and of course, Stephen A. is the expert on this. <laughs> but they have a way of of. <laughs> I, I, how else could I see it? They, they yeah. have a way of spitting a bit uh, yep. when it comes. <laughs> they uh, they look good during the year. This is going to be their year. The Cowboy fans, let's go. How about them Cowboys? Everybody is, you know, all all psyched up about it. And and then they spit the bit. They they screw it up. They they find a way to screw it up. And it's always the same. Like, well, maybe <laughs> next year's the next. That'll be their year. You know, that'll be their year. If you know, they go out in the first round, it'll be, I'll be curious. I'll be curious to see what what moves they make. Because if if a poor Dak, I mean, he's he's a cool, they he will make the really right good. moves. I'm going to go out on the limb and say they won't. I'll tell you why. Because the owner, as rich as he is, as successful as he's been, and he has been, the owner won't make the right moves because he wants to be involved in football operations that he probably shouldn't be involved in. But but he's 100%. the owner. And, and his ego, you know, his ego, his success in other businesses will not allow him to see that he should allow the experts, the people that are really, truly making a living in this business, for them to do the job. He still wants to have a say. He still wants to have his hand, whether it's at the GM or the overseer or the final word, whatever. And it's He'd his probably life. like to make himself the coach. He, he probably and it's his right he's the owner but it is doesn't mean it doesn't mean it is right it doesn't yeah. mean it is right because one of these weeks we could do a whole show on like gms and how organizations are run the ones that are done well and the ones that are done poorly because this whole season has been an interesting case study with 
Uh, the Titans, they fire the GM because the kid, the guy trades away A.J. Brown to Philly. He came back to the Tennessee, and he put a boot in their behinds. He A.J. Brown scorched them so bad that they fired the GM, and that had to be a big component. Then same thing in the, uh, Arizona. They can uh, Cliff Kingsbury, the uh, the head coach there. And, and to make matters worse, they were on Hard Knocks in season, like a special edition of Hard Knocks. So they're highlighting all the all the dysfunction on HBO and this and of course the owner shows himself flying his private jet I was just like man he's got to be watching this thing and this was a mistake to have them filming me recording my flying my jet like hey I'm the big shot coming in and your team's getting whooped left pillar to post um just interesting um those I think those parts of the sport are very interesting how the operations are run and the decisions that are made from the GM to the coach to the owner it's like I don't know I find it all really intriguing but everyone's here to hear about boxing and UFC so let's get cracking um before we do let me remind everyone that if you want to take control of your own personal health and wellness why don't you start with some athletic greens Go to athleticgreens.com slash atlas. Take advantage of the special opportunity to get 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. Athletic Greens is an all-in-one green drink. You little scoop in the morning with 8 to 10 ounces of water. Shake it up. Boom. You've got every essential vitamin, mineral, nutrient that you need for the day. Even if you're eating the healthiest diet, Athletic Greens is like an insurance policy to make sure you get all the vitamins and minerals you need for a healthy diet day to day. It's made from 75 whole food sourced ingredients, so it's not synthetic vitamins jammed into a capsule. These are like freshly ground, like I guess vegetables and uh, minerals put into a green powder. It actually tastes really good. I enjoy it. I look forward to it. Athleticgreens.com slash Atlas to get 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. Ted, a UFC fight night. Not the most exciting card we've ever seen, but when you show up every week and put on 50-ish events a year, you know what? You can't control if the fights don't aren't exciting every week, and um, this falls into the category of one that's not necessarily rememberable. But let's start with the co-main. Dan Ige scores a second-round knockout over Damon Jackson. Um, I don't have many descriptors for this one. What'd you think of that one? First of all, Dan Ige looked nice with the hands. Yeah, he did. I mean, first thing I want to do is I want to give him a nickname, Iggy. I want to call him the Hawaiian Punch because <laughs> he's from I Hawaii. Like yeah, he's from Hawaii. Everybody's looking to get a little promotional help and, you know, a little glitz, a little bells and whistles. So, you know, it doesn't hurt. You want to make money. You want to get attention, but you got to be able to fight. That's the first thing. And he could fight. So call him the Hawaiian Punch, that beautiful kind of left hook that he landed to end his fight to knock out Jackson. I remember there was a Hawaiian Punch, Brian Valoria. He was, uh, yeah. he, yep. he was a fighter. Uh, he was an Olympian. He was a world champion boxer. I was going to say, I think someone has that. I was scrambling to look it up on the internet, but you beat me to it, I, as usual. <laughs> no, Brian, Brian Valoria, he was a little guy. He was like 106 pounds, 112 pounds, flyweight, whatever they call those weights. Sometimes I don't even know. They call them like air weights, like paper weights, you know. Um, but I think straw it was weight, and they have straw one called, weight. They have one called minimum weight. Minimum weight. Wow. A minimum weight. Yeah. <laughs> what do you weigh? I'm minimum weight. I'm, I'm, I'm minimum. That's like I'm, saying, like, mind your own business. I weigh enough to fight. <laughs> yeah, I'm minimum weight. But um, so he he was, um, he landed a, a really tremendous kind of left hook, but he set it up. It's always about to set up the delivery. And he set it up. He fought a very disciplined fight. Uh, looking from the very beginning, Ken, to look to play shots and looking for the counters. And he set up the counter left hook that he finally scored the knockout with by being calm, being set on his feet, like Inoue, the great world champion from Japan, always set on his feet to deliver power. And his ability to control range with little steps out was the part of the difference, part of his success. And what created the opening, and I always talk about that, is one thing to have athleticism, but you got to have technique to go along with your athletic abilities so it's used properly. And what created the opening for Iggy to land the left hook 
was a flaw by Jackson where he dropped his hand to throw the uppercut and he left himself, he left his space. He left a hole and the hole was filled by Iggy with the left hook. You don't drop your hand, especially from a distance, to throw a punch. As I would always say, training fighters in the gym, Ken, you don't give up defense for offense. That That's a no-no. And again, you have to have good teachers. You have to have technique. And the technique has to become a habit. Um, just like you get, you know, bad habits. You gotta, they form. You have to form good habits. Uh, Iggy has a great backstory, Ken. Uh, he's been fighting and he's been dealing with depression and other mental health issues. He's just a, he, he seems to be a great guy and an, and really easy guy to root for. So I was very, very impressed with the way he did it. Not just the punch, as I said, but the way he set it up. Uh, but I'm very happy for him because, like I said, he's been overcoming things outside the cage in his life. Uh, he's been dealing with them. He's a real fighter. And you just root a little extra for a guy like that. Yeah, and you know what was interesting is coming into that fight, Teddy, he was one in four in his last five UFC fights. He needed this win as bad as anyone's ever needed a win. You're right, Ken. And that was part of, listen, that's part of, I'm sure, what connected to his depression. You know, his, his obviously his, his mental state. You know, that was part of it. And so it was really, really good to see a guy who's, you know, battling with those storms, you know, around him, you know, mentally, uh, to be able to get in there and do what he did. It was it was it was great. It was yeah. it was really nice. Definitely a feel good story. I remember he like when when he first started on that um the first loss where he went on the one and four streak, he, he lost, he won one, then he lost three in a row. But that loss he took to Calvin Cater was a bad one. Calvin Cater was looked as good as he's ever looked on the feet. That was uh, maybe a year or two ago. But um, all right, in the main event. These guys, Sean, Ken, just one thing to that. Yeah. You know, that you brought it up. These guys fight monsters. They're not right. out there. They're not there's out no layups. There. Oh, my goodness. There's no freaking layups. You're right, Ken. I mean, these guys, <laughs> you got to take your hats off to them. Um, that's why I'm glad, and that's the next guy we're about to talk about, when a guy like Strickland can get a boatload of money, when, when he can demand extra money, you know what? Bring Brink's truck to all of them. Bring back up the truck, Brink's truck to every one of them and every boxer out there when they can make it because they deserve it, because of what they deal with to get ready, to the pressures they deal with every day, and and then... The, the reality of the dangers that they deal with when they get it, whether it's getting in the octagon or in a boxing ring, that they're getting out of that ring or out of that cage with less of what they went in there with. Wow. Wow. I yep. mean, again, back up the truck. <laughs> Anything they ask for they or they can get, you know, if they're good enough to demand it for all the different... You know, all the different things that have to line up to demand that kind of money. Give, I'm glad when they get it. And Strickland was able to be in that position, getting caught on at the last minute. Go ahead, take it from there. I just wanted yep. to piggyback that. That's all. Strickland gets a call last minute to still step in for Calvin Gastelum and face um, Nazardine Imamov. Imavov and um, Strickland, again, like you said, short notice. I think he had one, maybe two weeks, but he's also coming off a devastating lockout, knockout loss to Alex Perea, the current champ who just beat Izzy, and then he lost a split decision to Jared Cannonier. Let me see when that Cannonier fight was. I thought he won was... that fight. Ken, I thought he won that Cannonier yeah. fight. Very close, but... Yep. I thought that he had won that fight with his jab. That's his forte. You know, that's his thing, the jab. And I thought that he had controlled the pace and the geography of that fight enough, the Cannonier fight. And Cannonier is good. But I thought, you know, they're, they're all good. But I had thought that he deserved to get that Cannonier fight. So even double, he, I'm, I'm happy that Strickland jumped in there late notice and was able to get not only paid, but also get the win. But Teddy, he went 
He lost a five-round decision to Cannoneer four weeks ago, and now he gets in. It's it's funny because on this UFC official thing, it says it was a five-round. He won a five-round decision, but as I'm looking at the scorecards, I see 49-46, 49-46. Oh, okay, yeah. So he, so he goes two five-round fights four weeks apart, and he gets the win 49-46 on two cards, 48-47. All stand-up. I mean, I think, if anything, maybe Strickland probably had a little advantage on, with the jab. He seemed to work behind that jab all night he just does. with mixing That's up jabs, thing. kicks. Yeah. And, and let me tell you, I've, I've met him in person once with um, with Matt Serra and Ray Longo in the, uh, at a hotel in New York. You liked him. I know. You Maryland. told me you liked oh. You found him engaging and... Incredibly like kind, nice guy to talk to. But I'll tell you one thing, Teddy, in, in person... The, all these guys at 185. You see a guy who's walking around at like 200, 205, cutting down a one. I mean, he was just, I just remember thinking, this is a big friggin' guy. And if he wanted to start like cracking people in here, <laughs> I'd be like, oh man. Normally I'm like, yeah, better to fight and lose. So I was I'm looking at him, the I was place like, man, clean out. hopefully the I place, can outrun place, this guy. <laughs> the place would clean out fast. <laughs> just, you know. it just strong, thick, big guy. Like just a. Uh, Dude, well, that you know. to you, to you, you know, you're right on it because to what you're saying, right? To speak to what you're saying, he had to. They had to move the weight up to take this fight because he literally took it on five days' notice. They yep. had to move the weight up, and he didn't look out of his weight class when he got in that cage. It's <laughs> crazy, and and he didn't look out of shape, you know, and uh, you know, and we know he wasn't in top shape, but his cardio couldn't have been in top shape. Couldn't we know have been. it. No, we we know that, and he 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 basically said that. But he acted like a pro. Uh, he's got the experience. You know, he was good enough to go in there to do if he wanted to do it. If he wanted to do it, you know, was it was it with his was it optimal? Was conditions optimal? No, no, it was quick notice. But but to use a phrase from you, he's a fighter, and fighters when they get a call, they show up and fight. And they it's like find a, a way. It's like being a plumber. Hey, I know you usually install new plumbing, but my pipe just burst. Okay, I'll be right over. I'm a plumber. Yeah. I'll fix it. That's right. And what's the key to a fighter? Not just being able to know how to fight, how to behave like a fighter. He knew how to behave like a fighter. Hey, guys, quick pause to thanks today's uh, sponsor. Today's episode is brought to us by our newest sponsor, HelloFresh. HelloFresh delivers high-quality farm-fresh ingredients for easy-to-make meals. If eating healthier is part of your New Year's resolution, HelloFresh makes that easy. It will also help you save money. It's not only easier, but also cheaper than both grocery shopping and takeout. I've been using HelloFresh for a couple weeks myself now, and I love it. It's surprisingly very good and easy way to eat healthy, and we all need to eat a little bit healthier. Enjoy taste and, enjoy taste and quality done quick with recipes like falafel power bowls, seared steak and potatoes, southwest pork and bean burritos. To check them out, go to HelloFresh.com slash Atlas22, that's A-T-L-A-S-2-2, and use the code Atlas22 for 22 free meals plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash Atlas for 22 free meals plus free shipping. This, you know, and that's it. Same thing. You know, the, this, I remember there was a, there was a, <laughs> The Met fans out there, Matty Sanduli, my former uh, coordinating producer at ESPN, and more importantly, my friend, he, I remember he was a big Mets fan, and now he's working for NYS uh, Sports. He's got his dream job where he's, covered, you know, where he's doing the Mets uh, all year long. Uh, he also does UConn women's basketball, and he does a great job. And But I'm so happy he's got his dream job. But... He remember this guy. He he played for the Mets. I think he originally played for the Montreal Expos, but Rusty Staub. He was a good hitter. And he was, I don't know how old, let's just say he was about 40, and he was still a great pinch hitter. And I remember somebody saying about him, like, hey, he's like 40 years old, whatever the frig he was, and and he, he'd get up in the middle of the ninth inning, he'd get up after sitting on a bench the, the whole game, and he'll go out there and he'll get you a hit. And I remember someone saying, that, that guy will get you a freaking hit when he's 80 in the middle of the winter. You wake him up. You, you wake him up in the middle of the winter. He'll get out from bed. He'll come out, and he'll get you a hit because that's what he does. 
He's a, he hits. <laughs> he he's a professional hitter. You know, he and it's not just the stroke. It's it's what we're talking about. It's not just that he swings the bat even and he keeps his eye on the ball. It's the demeanor. It's the demeanor that that he thinks the way a pro has to think under their pressure under whatever those pressures are, no matter what the situation. And it's the same thing. Strickland acted like a pro. Strickland acted like a fighter, like you said. Strickland knew how to behave. Yeah, he took it on quick notice. But yeah, he's experienced. Yeah, he's the real deal. He went in there and he made the most. He made the most of that opportunity. First of all, he he had the, you know, what? Whatever you want to call it, some people say the coyons, the uh, you know whatever the the uh, certain people say. But he he had the guts, the belief uh, to go and take the fight, and he didn't make a secret about it. He got paid a lot. He had to get paid right, and why not? Why not? There's a business to it. But he went out there and he took the fight. He had the belief in himself to take the fight. And he made the most of it. He's right back in the mix now. You know, he's right back. He had two bad losses. You know, Cadenia wasn't a bad loss. Like I said, I thought he won the fight. And then he got knocked out Pereira by Pereira, who's a beast. Who's, who, he's, you know, he's the guy who just knocked out well, Israel. Also, yeah, I was going to say he also knocked out Israel Adesanya, who looked unbeatable. And uh, this yeah. guy's the real deal. So, so, so he, he goes in there and he beats even. Imavov, um, he he did what he does. That's his calling card. Card you were on it, Ken. His jab. That's his calling card. You know when he wears clothes, he should get his own clothing line with like a a signa, uh, signia of a jab. You know that should be his clothing line. You know where you have where you have Izot with the alligator. He should have his clothing line with the jab. Because that's what he does. He controls the geography of the ring, the range of the ring. He makes it his fight when he can. And he uses the jab to do that. He sets the table with the jab. And then he'll look to eat with the right hands. I thought his right hands, he was throwing crooked ones, looping ones. And some of them were effective. They were, they were effective, but... I thought he could have straightened him out a little bit at certain parts, and that might have helped him a little bit. But he used that jab consistently. And here's the trick that I thought was really interesting for me in this fight. He comes in there. His cardio is not at, at its best. It's not. But he doesn't look that way. At, there were parts during the, as the fight progressed that he actually looked like the more conditioned fighter. And I'll tell you why. There's a reason for it, for my world. The reason for it was, first of all, he stayed calm. He didn't expend extra energy. He was calm, uncalm environment like we talk about. And that's where a lot of energy gets wasted on anxiety and nerves and all that. He's calm. He's a pro. He's experienced. He's been there before. He's been five rounds before. I don't think uh, Imavov had ever been five rounds so he knew that he could handle the distance, that confidence, that knowledge is very important. What he did was he kept the pace. He fought a brilliant game plan. He really executed a brilliant fight plan. He really did. He controlled the pace at a steady pace that was good for him. And then he tied up every once in a while. He clinched every once in a while, smothered Imavov on the inside where it gave him a little break. It gave him a little pit stop. It let him rest a little bit. And it kept control of the pace, where the pace stayed at a degree that was that was doable for him. And he was really, it was, I, I don't know if that was, if everyone appreciated what he did there. And it was really brilliant. And then the reason why he didn't get tired and the other guy got tired, the fifth round he got tired. They both got tired. But the reason for four rounds, he looked like a guy who had a full camp, which he didn't. Imavov had the advantage. He had a full camp. He should have been fresher. But he really wasn't. And I'll tell you why. Because Strickland was being the boss. He was dictating terms with that jab. 
He was dictating what was or wasn't going to happen. He was putting the pressure on. And when you're the one who's the boss, when you're dictating terms, when you're in the driver's seat, you know how nervous it is if somebody's driving a car and you're in the passenger seat. You're like, oh, my God, this guy's getting too close to these cars. Like my wife. Like my wife. She said, oh, my God, you're over on the left too far. Move over. You know, you, uh, you didn't stay. What are you doing? You didn't stop all the way. Sir. You know, you're in the passenger seat. You can't control things. When you're in the driver's seat, you're much calmer because you're in control. He was in the driver's seat. He's in control. He's establishing the rules. He's the one who's exerting the pressure. And when you're the one exerting the pressure, you don't feel tired. You don't feel the heat. You don't feel the anxiety that tires you. When you're the guy who's having the pressure applied to you, you feel it. You, you, get, you get melted by it. You get affected by it. You get worn down by it. You get tired from it. So the guy who's on the receiving end of the pressure, who's not really dictating terms, he's going to get tired faster than the guy who's the boss, the guy who's doing what he wants to do. Why? Well, a lot of it is psychological because you're in the right frame of mind. You're calmer. You're not expending all that nervous anxiety, you know, apprehensive energy. You're in control. And you don't get tired as easily as you do when you're the guy that's having to fight off the guy, having to have the guy coming at you. That impacts you. That really compromises you in a physical way. And that's what took place. That I just want the fans out there to understand that, that that's what I saw for me with my experience from where I come from, that's what was happening. And that's why a guy on quick notice looked like he was in top shape when he wasn't. He really wasn't in top shape. Then what happened? He he wins the first round. Imavov wins the second round because I think he stole the second round. Imavov, uh, Imavov, um, I think he stole the second round late in the round, Ken, where... He was able to score late, and he stole that round. So it was 1-1. And then the anxiety, the pressure became greater on Imavov because Strickland wins the second round, and he wins the third round. And now he's up 3-1 to one going into the last round. So the pressure is even greater now on Imavov where now he's got to, He's got a, he knows he's behind. He's told he's behind. So that anxiety is kicking in now. That there's desperation. There's maybe a little panic, you know, that he's behind and that he's got to come from behind. And another thing, another element. Don't, we're human beings. Everyone's a human being, even though these guys are beasts and they get in that ring and do what most people could never do. But they're still human. They still bleed red if you cut them. Don't think that he didn't think it was going to be maybe a little easier time getting this guy on short notice. Don't think he didn't, a little bit of that wasn't at play. And now all of a sudden, he's behind the eight ball. And now all of a sudden, he, you know, he, he's got to find a way. All of a sudden, he's, you know, he's got to regroup. And, and he's got to go like to DEATCOM 4 to pull this out. So all of that was at play. And then you had the last round. Uh, like I said, I had him up 3-1 to one going into the fourth round. I had Strickland up. And that was a great round. It was, it was a firestorm round. It was a great round. And it was a close round. Maybe Imavov might have grabbed that round, but it was a close round. He might have won that round, but... That was his best opportunity to really do what he had to do to win the fight, which was to either knock out Strickland or at least drop him a couple times to win the fight. And that was his best chance because Strickland then started to show that the gas tank was low. He started to get reckless. He started to get sloppy. 
He started to reach in a little bit, which, like I say, God bless him. You know, after doing what he did on five days' notice, I mean, really, hats off to him. Nothing but applause for him. But now it started to show he started to get tired, and that was the best shot for Imavov to counter him, to catch him coming in with, with a reckless punch and nail him. And the funny thing was, Imavov couldn't get it done. He, he couldn't quite get it done because he had tired. He also, even, even though he was the guy that was supposed to be the fresher guy, the guy that was had the full training camp, he, from all the things I just said, from, from all those jabs in his face, from the pace being dictated all night long by Strickland, he was, he was towards, the gas tank was going towards E with him too. So he couldn't quite put himself together and set his feet and get the shots off quite the way he needed to to catch Strickland coming in a little sloppy. And at the end of the day, and Strickland, to his credit, in that last round, he kept fighting. He kept shooting bullets. You know, it's not like he went into a prevent defense. You know, he, he kept trying to keep Imavov on the defensive, you know, so he couldn't do anything. But he was leaving himself open, but it didn't come to pass. Imavov wasn't able to catch him with that clean shot that he would have needed to pull off the comeback win. And Imavov was a favorite going into that fight. I don't think he was a big favorite, but he was it was definitely a slight favorite. So really a nice win. Really a nice win for Strickland. And I got to mention one other thing uh, about Strickland where I, I feel a little... You met him. You talked to him. You told me he was a good guy. You told me he was an engaging guy. He had a great personality. You know, I, I know he's known for his smack talking and all that stuff. A lot of them are. You know, I know all that. But my son, when he was with the Raiders, he got he got Strickland a jersey. He wanted. He's apparently he's a big. Oakland Raider fan. Now, of course, it's the Las Vegas Raiders. But he was a big Oakland Raider fan. And he went to a game. He wanted a jersey. So the Raiders, my son, had it made for him. My son got the jersey, had it made for him, and got it to Strickland. So so if you're out there watching uh, that jersey, my son got it for you. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that I was going to bring that up and say I think it, I, I thought that Teddy Jr. had a relationship with uh, Strickland. That uh, no, no, he makes, didn't. But makes just sense. That he got Two him nice the guys. Yeah, yeah, well, that's a relationship as far as I'm concerned. Um, yeah, good breakdown, Teddy. Thank you. I appreciate the analysis on that one. Let's jump over to boxing. I think the uh, boxing gods, or at least the uh, at least the. Athletic Commission up at the Turning Stone uh, Reservation heard your uh, rap last week about why are we not using replay in boxing because, and listen, I don't want to suggest that the ref was trying to do anything uh, other than be above board, but um, Vito, They make mistakes. They make yep. mistakes. Yep. Uh, Guido Vianelli was in with Johnny Rice, and Johnny Rice, interestingly enough, was a last-minute replacement on less than a month's notice. He was supposed... Um, the Italian uh, Guido was supposed to fight Oscar Rivas, the Colombian, and he got a uh, Rivas got a detached retina in training. So uh, step in Johnny Rice, who comes in at fifteen and six, if I'm not fifteen six and one at the time. Kind of did what he kind of did what Strickland did, but go ahead, go ahead. Yep, yep. On a, a, yeah, he had a month's notice, and uh, at heavyweight boxing, you know, I oh, imagine yeah, Strickland's notice, probably right. a freak when it comes to staying in shape, but. Um, Johnny Rice steps in on less than a month's notice. He's sick. Like I said, he's 15 and six. He gets in against a 10 0 and one undefeated Italian Olympic boxer represented by top rank. And uh, in the sixth round, Johnny Rice cracks him a shot, cracks Guido a shot, and busts his eye open real bad. Now, like I said, I assume everyone's being above board, and Benji Estevez. Um, didn't see the punch, apparently. He called it a headbutt. So in the seventh round, he stops the fight. We're going to go to the scorecards, he says, which would have had Vito winning. Let me tell you what the scorecards were, so I'm not making any mistakes here. But they go if they had gone to the scorecards, which is what uh, the referee was suggesting, 
The uh, undefeated Italian Olympian Guido Vianelli gets the decision by 59-55, twice 58-56. But someone, either from the Athletic Commission, from ESPN, someone says to Benji, I think you better look at the replay. And I don't well, even you know, know if they have yeah, a... I, It wasn't from ESPN. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to say it was, but... Uh, That's they fair, won't, right? Yes. They ESPN won't go, and Top Rank they were, were definitely not looking for a replay. No, it wasn't their fighter from them. Was, it so, was from so, a guy who will never be allowed at a ringside fight again when yeah. ESPN is doing the show. That's who it was from. I was just going to say... And whoever, I'm joking. I'm kidding. Whoever, I'm kidding. Well, I'm not joking when I say, hey, whoever did that, great job. Sorry to see you go. We're going to miss you, but I'll guarantee yeah. you're not coming back. And well, uh, they go to this. They go to. Yeah, they there, will, there will not be a seat for you at the next <laughs> top ranked show. Um, you will no longer be uh, welcome here. Kind of like you, my friend Bill Krakenberger, <laughs> who, who they call him the Crack Man. You know, he's a handicapper. He's one of the better handicappers out there in the world of gambling. He's he's one of the few that actually it's make gambling a legend. At, yeah, he makes a living at it. And I'm talking about gambling legend or, or about uh, handicappers. I should throw in Alan Boston. He's also a legend. He's a guy that. That, oh, he's a legend. He's a guy that found a way to figure out the college, just college. That was his expertise. College basketball, the totals, how, how to figure out the winners, the sides, but but I think mostly the totals. He he just he he did a he did an unbelievable dive into examining, you know. All the the defenses, the coaching, the uh, just all elements of it, and the numbers of it, and and what the scores, who would, what the chances of it being low score and high score, and 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 he got to a point where he became like this legend, uh, Alan Boston, of being able to figure out college basketball games, and and I think the totals, because like I said. That, that kind of became his science, uh, and he made it a science. But anyway, the point I was making was these guys aren't always welcome at certain gambling institutions, put it that way. Uh, and I have to laugh because Krakenberger, who's also a very good, uh, a very good blackjack player, you know, besides being a, you know in the handicapping business overall in sports, and so he, you know... He's got an edge. He knows how to, hey, let's put it right out there. But people kind of know me that I don't kind of hide things. He knows how to count cards. But it's not illegal. It's not like he's putting a mark on the cards. It's not like he's fixing the game. It's not like, you know what I mean? He's using his expertise. He's using his brain. He's using something he developed to be able to figure out, you know, something that gives him a better chance. A better chance. And look, the casinos, they give you no shot because then they put five decks in the they, they put five decks in the shoot, so you so it don't matter. Or three decks or four decks, whatever. But anyway, if he can get a shoot with one deck or whatever, uh he's got a better chance. Well, being you would think that should that would be applauded. And it's it is, it's applauded in certain areas, but not when you go into a place that makes their living out of making sure everybody loses. <laughs> well, where they want everyone to be a sucker, where they want everybody to go out of there, you know, with their their empty with their pockets empty, right? With lint. Like like you you and me have done a few times, Ken. Where <laughs> you, you, you were rapid ears, where you pull your the <laughs> pants pockets out and you got rapid ears with, with a little lint. With a little lint coming out. That's what they want. But I have to laugh when we're talking about this because with Bill Krakenberger, uh, he, he'll he get to a casino sometimes and he'll get to the front door about to go in, you know, maybe to play a little blackjack, whatever, uh, like anybody else. And all of a sudden he'll get met by a representative of the casino and say, hello, Mr. Krakenberger. It's nice to meet you. Um, it's very nice to have you here. Um, you're welcome to go and eat in one of our restaurants or go to one of our shows, but um, your business at the tables is not wanted. Um, you will not be allowed to play at any of our tables. Other than that, have a good time. <laughs> you know, like, you can't come here because you actually know what you're doing. You actually know what you're doing. So you you can't come here. 
But um, getting back to the point that that we were, you know, on is that it's. Uh, I don't think that that guy joking around, of course. I don't think that that guy, he'll be treated kind of like Krakenberger would be at a casino. Uh, there will no longer be a seat here for you, sir. Uh, you're no longer wanted uh, anywhere near ringside at a top-ranked show. You did a great job, nice job, but um, you will never be on uh, site again, and you'll never have a chance to do that job again because... <laughs> You screwed up. <laughs> you got yeah. it right. You got it right. You actually got it you. right. <laughs> but but to your point, we were talking about this last week. I was screaming about when is boxing going to catch up to the other sports and use and use instant replay. The, and and I've been saying this for years. I've been saying it on our show since we started this show. And finally, finally, finally. Somebody used, did the right thing. They went to the, they went to the videotape, like the great Warner Wolf. Remember Warner Wolf, the great yep. uh, sports commentator? Let's go to the videotape. Let's go to the videotape. They finally went to the videotape. And you know all that matters at the end, Ken? And the reason why I scream about it and the reason why we're talking about it and the reason why it's important, they got it right. You just want to get it right. And you got a better chance of getting it right if you go to the videotape to see it to, right there in front of you. A referee could miss it. Yeah, Benji Estevez, he's a good referee. He's an experienced referee. He's an honest referee. He thought it was a head clash because, you know, it happens quick. It happens real fast, live time. Bang, bang. And he thinks, oh, oh because when the punch lands, you don't see the blood come right away. You don't. And then all of a sudden they fall in, right? And the, the head gets in close. And then they separate and you see the blood. Three seconds went by. Yeah, it took two seconds for the blood to start to come out. Yeah, you get hit, you don't see it right. And then all of a sudden it comes out. But then all of a sudden if they had fallen into a clinch, and I don't know, I wasn't watching the fight, I only saw the end of it. But if they fell into a clinch, then all of a sudden they separate, you see the blood, you say, oh, you assume... It was a headbutt. And you know that old saying. What's that old saying, Ken? But your teachers used to tell you all the time, and maybe your mother used to tell you, and your grandmother, when you assume something, you make <laughs> a, you know what, out of you and me. Yep. Why not take the assumption out of the game, out of such an important sport, a dangerous sport, where the fighters are paying the ultimate price at the end of the day, why don't you take the assumption, the guessing, out of it and get it right for the sake of the fighter, for the sake of the sport? And they finally did. Yep, they did. And uh, like I said, that guy who uh, pointed that out to Benji will not be invited back. He cost Guido a win, upset the apple cart. The undefeated record is gone. Johnny Rice moves to 16-6. and six. And that was all on the um, undercard, of course, of the um, the other heavyweight fight that we were talking about last week. A, 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 I always say the guy's name, a Jogbe, a Jogbe. Am I saying that right, Teddy? How, you know, how the only you thing it? I got to say one thing. The only thing that bothers me. I'm glad they got it right, Ken. Yeah, but it had to take a sovereign nation. India casinos, a sovereign nation. It had to take someone from there to interject. Because because the the die was cast already, it, it was gonna go it was gonna go to you know to a technical decision, and Vianello would have won, and it was it was gonna be it was a done deal. It took somebody having to say override the ref, had to stand up and say why don't we look at the videotape? I think you might have got it wrong. Why don't we take a look at the and they did. Thank goodness. Credit to them. They did. But what I'm saying, Ken, and it shouldn't be missed, is that let's not wait for somebody to jump in there and say, hey, wait a minute. Let's go to the video. Let's make it a rule where when you have videotape and you have a clash or what you think is a clash ahead, you have a cut that's, gonna, that's obviously going to impact the fight. It's going to stop the fight, right? It's going to 
uh, it's going to change the course of people's careers, go to the freaking videotape. Don't wait for somebody from the commission or somebody from the stands to jump up and say, hey, maybe you should look at the videotape, guys. You got the videotape. It should be an automatic rule. It should be it should be done. You, you're going to go, right. okay, we had a head clash. We had a knockdown. We're not sure if it was a clean knockdown. Let's go to the videotape before we make a ruling on it, before we destroy someone's career, before we get it wrong. Yep, I agree. Uh, in the main event of possibly one of the most boring heavyweight fights in ages, um, F.A. Ajagbe and Stephen Shaw, both with a chance I to just address. woke up. I just woke up from the fight about a half hour before the show. All right? Oh, Not man. that it was boring, but I'm just saying. Yeah, uh, there's been a few that have been like this. The one that sticks out to me is a UFC fight when we talk about um, – uh, Derek Lewis and uh, Francis Ngannou, which is crazy to think the two killers would be so cautious with each other. But these two big guys, Stephen Shaw and F.A. Jagbe, both on ESPN, main event, chance to impress. Let's go. Let's do this, guys. And Great matchmaking. Great matchmaking. And listen, I'm us. being facetious, but really, can you do better matchmaking maybe? You don't yeah. know the styles? You're, that's your job. That's your job. That's like me being a tailor and you come to me and I don't know how to put a cuff. I don't know how to put a cuff on your freaking pants. I mean, come on. <laughs> you're, I'm a tailor. I got to put a, I got to know how to put a cuff on your pants. You're coming to me for that. Really? You're a matchmaker. I say it again. Matchmaker. You're supposed to know how to make matches that are matches that the public would actually like to watch, not get put to sleep. You know, I uh, yeah, agreed. A jog bay won the last four rounds on all three judges' scorecards. I believe he's the favorite coming in. I think he was the A side, but this fight was so boring. It's like who even cares? Neither one of them clear. N no one seemed to even want to do anything to win, uh, for lack of a better term. It was just it stunk. Um, quickly, what are your thoughts? I don't want to waste a lot of time on it because there was a big announcement in the UFC that I'm sure more people are interested than in hearing about this snooze fest. How'd you like that one? Aside well, from it was being a snooze fest, but it was, it was a jab fest. It was all jabs, 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 jabs. And, you know, it was all about the jab. And it was really came down to who wanted it more, a little more. And that was a jog bar. A jog bar decided to be more aggressive with his jab, do a little bit more pushing with it, pressing forward with it, taking charge more, and taking a little, nobody wanted to take risk, but he took a little bit more, he did a little bit more, and he clearly won the fight because of that. I thought the commentators were kind of like, almost, I don't know, rooting for Shaw, but I, I thought they were talking like Shaw was, I didn't think Shaw was winning the fight, I thought a jog ball was, especially from the middle part on, because I just thought he was doing what I just said, being a little bit more of the boss coming forward behind the jab in more of an aggressive fashion than Shaw was. Um, both of them were very, very, very cautious, careful. They didn't want to leave an opening for the other. They were very worried about making mistakes. Um, it was like, it was definitely a chess game all night and you got to the point where you were praying that a checker game would break out. Uh, a, and just that this game of chess would become a game of checkers because checkers is a little more exciting than chess because you could jump. You know, you do a double jump. You do a triple jump. You know, I'm going to jump your guy. Jump this guy. You know, there's a little bit more ex something going on with checkers uh, that would have been a little more watchable than what we watched but at the end of the day a jog bar did want it more i i think it was that simple matter of fact i thought Shaw was probably the more sophisticated boxer not that you could tell he didn't go out of his way to show it but i thought he probably was and a jog bar was probably a little bit more conventional not as maybe con 
maybe not as sophisticated as I said, uh, where Shaw could do more things, but he didn't do more things. He didn't. Sh- he didn't display it. I just could see that he probably was a little bit more developed in certain areas, but it didn't matter because it he he didn't have the temperament to go along with it, to take a chance. I thought that Ajagba did a good job of stepping out with his legs out of range. He's a big guy. He stepped out of range to make Shaw miss when Shaw threw. Not that it was the hardest job in the world because, you know, the punches were, were few and seldom in between coming from Shaw. But when Shaw did decide, kind of like when Haley's Comet decides to show up every <laughs> once in a while, when, when Shaw did decide to throw some punches, Ken, Ajagba did a good job of stepping out. But here's the thing. When he stepped out, he stepped out on a straight line and he did the job. He got away from the initial couple punches, but he was still in the line of fire. He was, if Shaw would have followed up his misses, he would have found Ajagba. He would have caught him because Ajagba rarely moved his head. Like I said, he went straight back. He was still in the path of the punch if Shaw would have advanced the punches. But he never did. He missed the first two and he stopped. And that was the end of it. Um, so, at the end of the day, Shaw loses his undefeated record. I believe it was undefeated. He, he loses that. And um, and Ajagba's got one loss. You know, they're not guys that scare me in the heavyweight division. I mean, the heavyweight division uh, really is top heavy. You got the top guys and then there's not really a lot you know, to crow about. Uh, that's in a the pretty middle. good. De- that's a pretty good description, Teddy. Because I think once you get away from the top three, maybe on a stretch five guys, it falls off precipitously, and then you've got this kind of like B level, second tier guys. And I don't even know if these guys, I'd put them in there with some of those B level guys personally. But and I was think? grateful to top rank for one thing. They got the fight on just when after the Jaguars Chargers game, which was a hell of a game. I yeah, of I would have hated to miss any of that game to watch this. So for, <laughs> so for that, I'm grateful. I am. And I'm also grateful that once again, they they helped us get a good night's sleep, you know, because I was kind of psyched up. I was kind of, my adrenaline was flowing after the football game because, you know, it was it was such a entertaining football game and such an arousing game. I was, I was kind of, you know, it was, I was having, I was, I was worried whether or not I was going to be able to get to sleep after watching that game. I was so, you know, invigorated by it. And, and then top rank as usual, you know, they, they have a way of doing that sometimes. Uh, they came along and they said, don't worry. Um, I got something to calm you down. Something to get you <laughs> nice and ready for bed. <laughs> oh, you got some You got some melatonin for me? No, let yeah, me put on yeah, a heavyweight no, fight for you. No, <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's, it does the same thing. You know, <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, it, it, the same results, Yeah. you know, it, it'll put you to sleep. Hey, hit us with this news. It's interesting. It's very interesting. Um, hit us yep. with this news because I know that the... <clears throat> that the fans, especially the MMA fans out there, want to wanna hear about this and want to talk about it a little bit. For sure. So Dana White comes out after the, um, after the fight night, the Strickland fight, and announces that Francis Ngannou has been stripped. He's no longer with the UFC. And uh, listen, Dana's been on the show. He's always been a friend to the show. But one of the things that really bothers me that they do it, it, it drives me crazy. Like, they clearly either lost a bidding war or Francis had other opportunities elsewhere. They didn't come to agreement on the terms. Okay, no big deal. Francis Ngannou is the scariest man on the planet as far as I'm concerned. He's the baddest man. He get in a cage. He's the heavyweight UFC champ. It's hard to dispute this. He beat, he's, beat, he's been in there and beat everybody, with the exception of John Jones coming up from light heavyweight. But to, to, to kind of dump on him on the way out because you couldn't get a deal with him done, there's no secret that they're at odds with Markel Martin, who's, who's Francis's manager and our friend, who was at CAA and now has his own agency. And it's like they, they have bad blood. There's no secret. But to, to pretend that Francis is anything other than the baddest dude out there is silly. Okay, you can put it up for this up to debate. This guy might be okay. He's the heavyweight champ. He beat Surreal Gun 
when he had to take it to a wrestling match, he did. Don't forget, he had one leg. He was like walking on one leg. He had a massive knee surgery after the fight. I just wish that they could have said, hey, we couldn't come to terms with Francis. Good luck to him. We're stripping him. The new fight is going to be John Jones, Surreal Gone going at it in March. And hopefully Stipe gets the winner in July. At least that's what Stipe said. So that's everything I know, Teddy. Dying to hear your thoughts on all of it. UFC kicking him when he's on the way out unnecessarily. I think it just makes them look... I don't like the look. It's like sour grapes. Like, okay, the guy had a better opportunity. Like, you couldn't come to terms. They haven't gotten along from the jump. Everyone knows it. What's your take? Well, I, I hear what you're saying, and that's why I sat quiet, because all sides should be said. And listen... We are friends with Francis and his team, his agent, and we've been with them before. We've had uh, Francis on our show a couple times. You've actually uh, been in the ring with Francis, and I was there. It was unbelievable to watch. Yeah, it was. It's on. It's out there on the internet. You could Google it. But um, and then Ken of did a little spa with him too to get him ready for you know <laughs> give him speed you know after i got finished training and gone you for a little while ken got in there and moved with him a little bit just you know give him a little work in the speed aspect of it when, when he needless to say passes. he jokingly put me in a guillotine and i think he legitimately almost broke my neck but it's out there um you know thank god he never broke his neck but <laughs> we um no, like we just said, I, I spent time with Francis. I, I was out in Vegas visiting my son. I was out there, and he found out I was out there. He asked if he could meet with me, if I could go in the gym with him to do a session with him, and I I did. Uh, I trained him for a training session there and went over some things that I actually think he implemented into his game uh, before the rematch with Miochik, uh, Miochik, um, which he did a brilliant job, and he showed development. And I'm not saying it's because of me, of course. It's because of his training, because of the work that he does, and because of the the, uh, the track that he was on to continue getting better, you know, after his only loss, which was to uh, Miochik uh, a couple years earlier. And then he came back and he... he fought the rematch, he won the heavyweight championship, and then he'd be gone uh, recently to defend the heavyweight title. But I, I I did think that he improved. He was a big, strong guy, and he improved for the second Mjolcek fight, which he had to do. And like I said, there were certain things that we went over that I actually saw him, in, I think, incorporate. And, and um, it's just credit to how athletic he is, how cerebral he is. You know how smart he is. How how quick he can pick up something, and and put it to, you know, put it to work. Uh, add it to his, you know, to to what he does, to his repertoire, if you will. And he's a good guy. He's a gentleman. He does good work in in Cameroon, his home country. He he's doing things to inspire uh, the youth there, give them hope to give them dreams that they can be like him, that they can get it, you know, they can pick themselves up and they can get to better places in life. Um, so he, he's important to that country. He's important to people. I like people that are important to more than themselves, that can be important, can motivate other people to be better and can take the time to do that. So that makes him, that makes him a little better than just a heavyweight champ for me. That makes him more than just a great MMA fighter or a great knockout puncher because he is a great knockout puncher. That human side, the care for humanity, that's that's what makes him better for me. And um, But I'm not going to be here and demonize Dana White either. Not for any reason other than that, yeah, we're friends with him. He's on our show just like we're friends with Francis. Uh, but... And I'm not defending anyone either side. But what I will say is White runs the show, obviously. He runs a business. And he runs it with an iron fist. I've called him a dictator before. And I joke. I called him a dictator when he was on the show. I said, the only difference, thank God he doesn't <laughs> lob heads. You know, he doesn't lob heads off like, like some dictators in the world. But it's his way or no way. He cares about one thing. 
And in some ways, I wish boxing had this, had a national czar, where he just cares about the brand. He cares about the business of UFC. Yeah, he makes money. Well, he makes a lot of money. I get it. Nobody has to tell me that. But he cares about the health of that sport, the health of the brand of UFC. That's what he cares about. And he makes the rules to make sure that the rules are consistent in a way that that brand will stay strong. And he does it by being the boss, by being in charge. And not everybody, you know, not everyone's going to always get along and, and like it. Uh, he's had trouble with guys where they've stayed. I don't think him and Nate Diaz were the best of friends, but Nate Diaz was with the UFC a long time, made a lot of money. I don't think him and Conor McGregor were the best of friends initially. I think they have yeah. a, a, a found respect for themselves now, but I don't think they, they were early on in their relationship, yet it made sense, stayed together, they worked together. They, they did. I, I think that would have... But some, I think that was happening and that would have happened, but they hit a blockade. They hit a blockade, obviously. And again, White cares about his, cares about himself like everyone does, but he cares about the product of UFC, what he thinks is best for that product. And he made a decision, obviously, that, he came out and he said, and I know that it could be taken two ways. He said, hey, listen, we were going to make Francis the, the highest paid fighter, I think heavyweight fighter ever. I, I don't know if he, if he made it uh, explicitly where it was heavyweight, Ken. You probably correct me on that. Or, or he just said the highest paid fighter, probably the highest paid uh, heavyweight fighter in MMA history or UFC history. So he was making that point that in other words, we were offering him something pretty good. Now, was it good enough? Obviously not for Francis and his people. We, I, all right, I get it. Um, but there's other factors going on here that we're never aware of until later down the road. When you become, yeah, there were personalities. Yeah, there was everything I just laid out. All of that. And I think that's fair. I laid it out fair. All of that. And both sides have something to scribble about. But there's only one side who's the boss. <laughs> I think the people out there know exactly what I'm talking about because they've been in these positions. You know, you might feel a certain way. You should get more. You're entitled to more. But you work for a company. You work for a firm or whatever it is that you work for. And if you're not the boss, at the end of the day, you might think you're worth more. You might really be worth more. You might want more, but that doesn't mean you're getting more because you ain't the <laughs> boss. And, 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 and everyone's lived with that. So I think that me breaking it down this way is the right way and a fair way. So, but at the end of the day, like I said, you don't know everything till you're going to know everything later. I would be shocked if Francis didn't have something else in of the course. hop, in the hopper, something else cooking, and maybe that something else would be somebody named Tyson Fury, in a mm -hmm. in a in a fight that would become, uh, it probably would pay him close to a hundred million dollars. It probably would be made into that kind of extravaganza, into that kind of Craig, kind of you know, the same way as McGregor and Mayweather made all that money. I think I think McGregor made like a hundred million dollars that night, or one hundred twenty million, whatever. I think I think Mayweather made um, close to three hundred million or two eighty, somewhere in that neighborhood. It, it was a crazy universe of money. It, it was it was insane, but it was a crossover match. It was. Uh, you know, it got the hoopla, it got everybody's attention, and this, you got the heavyweight champ of the world, Tyson Fury, the baddest man on the planet, against the other baddest man on the planet, Francis Ngannou, the, the UFC champion, who, who definitely could knock, he could knock walls down with his power, and that would be, you know, to, to coin a phrase from one of the Rocky movies, I, I think uh, it was the first Rocky movie, the original, which was a great movie, where they're looking to make Apollo Creed, they're looking to make Apollo Creed uh, with, uh, with uh, what was St uh, Stallone's uh, Balboa, with Rocky yeah. Balboa. They're looking to make that fight. And they're, they're looking at the names and everything, who they're going to fight, and then they come across this guy, 
you know, the Italian stallion, you know, <laughs> Rocky Balboa against Apollo Creed. And then Apollo Creed, who's a promoter, you know, he, he really is supposed to be Muhammad Ali. That's yeah. kind of the way they made him. And he's the undefeated heavyweight champ of the world, baddest man on the planet. And he's a great promoter. He's very smart, very witty. And when he sees it, he goes, that's it. He goes, damn it. He goes, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a damn monster movie. It sounds like a monster movie. Well, that's what, that's what Tyson Fury and Francis Ngannou would be. It'd be a monster movie. It'd be Godzilla meets, you know, uh, whatever. Who, who, uh, meets King wh Kong. whoever. Yeah, whoever the other monster of the day is. Uh, it, it would be that big. It would be that imaginative to the public's imagination and that's what it's about capturing the public's imagination the more you capture it the more money you can make and so i would be shocked if you don't hear in the future somewhere down the road that i put it this way i wouldn't be shocked if you heard down the road that francis got, he's got a very smart agent the guy and he's his friend He's his age and his friend. We, we met him. We've been around him. Uh, you know, he's, they're good people. And I'd be shocked if, and, and if you didn't hear somewhere down the road that, yeah, you're going to get a Tyson Fury, Francis Ngannou event, a uh, monster movie, and each guy is going to get somewhere south of, you know, $50 million. And that's being conservative. I know that's insane to say $50 million a piece is conservative, but it's probably conservative. It probably wind up going to the Middle East where, where a lot of these things wind up going, whether it's golf, <laughs> whether, whether it's boxing, you know, whether it's uh, Floyd, the great Floyd Mayweather doing his exhibitions. A lot of them go to the Middle East, right? Uh, where where the money is plentiful, where they're willing to give you a lot of money, right? There's a lot of oil out there, and there's a lot of cash out there. So at the end of the day, I hope that it works out good for Francis. I do. I, I, I hope it does, and I would bet, I would bet that it is going to work out good for him because to a certain extent, it's kind of like, I don't know if it was Ali or somebody, one of the heavyweight champs in boxing once said, hey, I don't need that belt to tell me or to tell the people or the public who the heavyweight champ is. They know who it is. People know who the UFC heavyweight champion is. It's Ngannou. It's fair. I know that they're going to they're, they're gonna make the John Jones, who's one of the greatest of all time, they're probably going to make him a gone, and we'll talk about that later uh, in a minute. But And that's an intriguing fight. Uh, for the reason says it's intriguing. But everyone knows Francis Ngannou is the champ, uh, the heavyweight champ. And if he gets in the ring with Tyson Fury, they'll come out because they know that. They'll they come out for that reason because he's this big, monstrous, powerful man who can punch like hell, and he's, he's the heavyweight champ. So you don't really need the labeling to be the heavyweight. You just need the public to know and to recognize who they recognize as the heavyweight champ. So it reminds me years ago when the IBF got started. You got the WBC, the WBA, and the, the IBF. And they weren't around. It was just really the WBC and WBA. And Larry Holmes was heavyweight champ of the world. I don't know if my memory's perfect or not perfect, but I know him in the neighborhood where he didn't want to defend for one of the titles against one of the opponents, one of the challenges that the organizations was demanding that he fight. You know, similar to this in certain ways, there's been a lot of cases in the history of my sport, boxing, where a champion, whether it was heavyweight or some other weight, didn't want to fight a, a fight that the organization wanted them to fight. So they fought someone else because they didn't have to have the belt. They went and fought someone else and made more money fighting a fight that the public, because at the end of the day, it's the public who's the boss. It's the public who's, who speaks. 
It's the public who makes that decision by paying for the pay-per-view, buying the pay-per-view, going out there and making that fight successful. They're the ones who are the ultimate judges and arbiters, if you want it, if you if you will, at the end of the day. They're the ones who make the final decision by saying, yeah, I'm going to pay for this fight. I'm going to make this fight successful by watching it. And like I said, there's been a lot of fighters in my sport, in boxing over the years, that didn't want to fight the guy that the organization told them they had to fight, and they went and fought someone else because they could make more money and it worked out because they were still recognized as the champion. Because they were. Because the public recognized them. So don't forget that factor. That's, that's there too. That, that's there on, in this too. And as I was saying about Holmes, Holmes didn't want to fight somebody, I think, if my memory serves me correct. He had, and... He had won the heavyweight title against Ken Norton in an unbelievable fight, one of the greatest last rounds of all time in heavyweight boxing. It was a 15th round that decided two men's futures in different ways. The 15th round, great round. One of the great, people should Google it. One of the great rounds in boxing history, especially heavyweight history. And Ken Norton went on to be a footnote where very few people remember him, unfortunately, even though he not, he broke Muhammad Ali's jaw they remember that, and he fought him three times and beat him once, and some people thought he really beat him at least twice, Ali, that is, but Larry Holmes was the guy who became heavyweight champ and went on to make a lot of money, and there was a point, I think, in his career where he refused to fight someone, and he gave up the belts, and there was a new organization called the IBF that was just starting, and he became their champion. They needed him, they needed legitimacy. He gave them legitimacy. And it gave him a trinket. You know, it gave him a, you know, it gave him a title that he really didn't need because everyone knew that he was the champ. But it gave him a belt. It gave him, a, it gave him something to, you know, to show uh, when he got in the ring and to hang his hat on and to make people say, oh, yeah, this is for the heavyweight title, you know. So I think that, all of that that I just covered, that 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 is all of this this territory that we're talking about, this this property, if you will, uh, this space out there that we're that we're covering. I I think that this has happened before. This ain't the first time people get up. Oh my God, this is happening. No, this has happened many times before in 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 my sport and. It happens in business all the time. And it'll happen again. And I hope that, you know, it works out for everybody. For everybody. For UFC, you know, on their side, they, they get a great fight with, with Gon and with, uh, with, uh, with John Jones, the legendary, iconic John Jones. And, and that it works out for our friend Francis and Ganyu that he gets what he wants in life and what he deserves for working so hard to get to where he got to, you know, being homeless in France, you know, and, and going there to make himself an MMA fighter. And he did. And he did. He's a great story. They should probably make a movie on him. Yeah, oh, exactly. I mean, the story of how he got from uh, Morocco over to Spain and then eventually to... Um eventually like you said to france is just unbelievable just, they're just getting from africa over to spain i mean i think he had six tries on a on a homemade rubber raft going across the uh, mediterranean Crazy. and getting rescued by the red cross incredible it's like story. hearing like about kids. some of these great cuban fighters and i think of my uh i think of my friend pedro now he's a great fan of the show he he's a great lawyer he's just a great sports well he's a great boxing fan uh great boxing fan and um, I, I was thinking, of just it came into my head when you mentioned going across on a raft. We've had so many great Cuban refugees, Cuban fighters that escaped that island on a raft, knowing that there's a good chance they could die, yeah. knowing they could get eaten by sharks. I mean, this is a fact. Knowing that they, you know, they they never gonna get there, but it goes to show you 
how blessed we are to be born here, to be living here, that there's people willing to risk dying to get here. Think about it. And that's what drives me crazy is when they come here and those people complain about this. Drives me crazy, Ken. I'm sorry. I know we, we didn't plan on getting in. We're not getting into it too heavy. But but I'm telling you, I'm not afraid to tell people how I feel. Yeah, I'm not afraid to say that. That drives me nuts. That drives me nuts. When, when you got people that are willing to get on a freaking raft with shark-infested waters <laughs> where they could easily drown, and they do drown, quite often just to get here uh, and like you said like what francis and ganya was willing to do you know to to get to a place that could better him to give him a chance to have a life not only did he get on a rubber raft made out of old car inner tube tire inner tubes he didn't know how to swim neither did probably the other 10 or 15 people that were all trying just to get to a better place risk their lives praying that the Red Cross would pull them from the sea versus the Moroccan Navy, which would send them right back to maybe a detention center or just throw them back into the country. So it's an incredible story. And the same thing goes on on the southern border. Most of those people coming over aren't Mexican. They're Guatemalan, South American, Central Americans that have like gotten trekked across Mexico. And now the cartels are, you know, raping them for Horrible. thousands and thousands Horrible. of dollars Horrible. to get them across but the border. But literally, literally, yeah. you're getting me nuts here. Literally <laughs> raping them. They're literally, yeah, oh, yeah. not just raping them in the way you're talking about taking their money, but literally raping them, yes. physically raping them. I oh think my that's God. lost on a lot of people is with the kind of risk and the danger that these people, and I know the hardliners are going to say, oh, the immigration. I agree. We should have a policy. There should be an organization. But as long as there isn't, there's going to be people like cartel members taking advantage of the system and taking advantage of the people that are desperate to get a better life and charging them to get across. These are like gang infested uh, uh, towns on the south of the border in Mexico. This is a dangerous situation. I know I'm opening a whole like, <laughs> oh. I'm opening a whole Pandora's box. I'm going to get attacked online. But Let's no, not no, you're not going to get attacked. You're not going to get attacked. The victims, uh, These people please, are not desperate get for help. And, and, and if you do, the, those people are not worth uh, worrying about. So let's get to the last part of this business that we have about now who will fight for Francis's vacated spot. Yeah, so we're gonna get uh, we're gonna get John Jones and Surreal gone. Hell of a fight. My my assumption or my guess is going to be. John Jones doesn't want to stand with uh, Surreal Gunn, although we've never seen anyone really be able to stand with John. Not when John's on his game. I mean, John, uh, obviously, against Dominic Reyes, he didn't look his best. But, you know, according to John, he was partying in the days leading up to it with uh, drugs and You booze. would think he's too small. You would think that his advantage yeah. would be to be more mobile. And um, the way Francis out-wrestled him with his lack of wrestling experience and just size and strength kind of like reminds me of Derek Lewis, who when sometimes people tackle Derek Lewis or, or grapple him to the ground and he just like it's like yeah get off me and throws them aside with no real no real technique just pure strength i would imagine john seeing that and the size of surreal gone as you know teddy with the heavyweights you just gotta get caught one shot there's too much risk i think for john i imagine john takes him down and wrestles him to death and beats him but what do you think what i think is this first of all you got to see what john jones shows up is it the iconic John Jones? Maybe some people think the greatest, you know, MMA fighter of all time. He's been off for a, a long time. He's been inactive for a long time. I mean, how long? Two and a half years? I don't know. I yeah, mean, you, question, you're going to confirm that for me now as I go on. And uh, so that's going to be the first thing is that this inactivity, how has it impacted the great John Jones. So that's that's number one. Last uh, last I'll, fight last fight Teddy was in uh February of two thousand and twenty. So it'll be it'll be just over three years since he's in the ring by the time he matches up in March. It'll be uh thirty seven months. All right, so three years is a long time. It's yep. reminiscent a little bit. It's funny you came up with three years because it's reminiscent a little bit of the great Muhammad Ali and you could compare them a little in their sports because Muhammad Ali, of course, iconic, great, special. Some people think the greatest of all time. And John Jones. And Ali was off for three years, um, a little over three years, actually, when he was 
forced into retirement in activity when his license was taken away when he refused induction into the army during the Vietnam War because of his beliefs, his religious beliefs. So, and he came back, he fought two tune-up fights against Jerry Quarry and Oscar Bonavina. No real tune-ups. Nowadays, they, they, people would never fight those kind of fighters as tune-ups. These were good, solid, dangerous fighters. Bonavita could punch. He dropped Frazier. Frazier beat him, but he dropped Frazier in those fights. But he fights the two of them and beats them. And then, you know, relatively short amount of time, he then fights the fight of the century against Frazier, and he loses. And he and a part of his losing was Joe Frazier, the great Joe Frazier, relentless guy that never stops coming with those left hooks. But also part of it was the inactivity. That was part of it too. It wasn't the same Ali. He wasn't able to float like a butterfly, sting like a bee all night long anymore after three and a half years off. That was part of it. So there's a big part of it too with John Jones. The difference here, John Jones ain't getting two tune-ups he's going right in so this is going to in some ways going to be almost more difficult i mean more incredible than in some ways than what ali was trying to do which at the end he didn't quite get it done but he fought a hell of a fight against frazier a hell of a fight a hell of a fight against him it was a lot closer than i think they they had it to be quite honest i don't think they liked ali too much back then but at the end of the day Jones is the more, supposed to be the more sophisticated fighter, the more mobile fighter. You already touched on it. Uh, the guy that, that's going to be trickier, the guy that's going to be more, you know, cerebral, more advanced. Um, he's going to use all of that for his greatness to try to pull off this upset. Aha, stop a minute. Stop right there. I'm here to tell you, maybe against, maybe against, Francis and Ganyu, that would have been true. And Francis is stronger than than Gan. You know, they're both big men, but Francis is physically stronger and he's developed more. He has developed and gotten better. But and Jones would have had that advantage of being more advanced, sophisticated in some of those areas against him. But he doesn't have that big advantage against Gan. Gan is much more developed and cerebral and and uh sophisticated in his approach and in his style than one might think one might think just because he's the behemoth he's the monster he's the giant you know he's goliath in this match against david they might think that goliath doesn't have anything more than size and strength advantage wrong 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 that's not Gan. Gan is developed. He's sophisticated. He's slick. He knows how to fight like a little guy knows how to fight in many ways. He's got the temperament of a little guy in many ways where he thinks defense. He thinks caution. He thinks cleverness. He thinks outsmarting somebody, being cute in the ring, doing tricky things. He thinks that. And he's got the benefit of both worlds. At the same time, he is big. He is giant. He is strong, but he's not Goliath. He's not one-dimensional. He's not just going to stand there and try to grab you. He, he's much more than that. This is very intriguing. This is very, the Francis and Ganyu fight was very, very, very intriguing. This fight is very intriguing in different ways, for different ra- reasons, because of different elements here that I just pointed out. Very interesting, very interesting. Can John Jones overcome the inactivity with no tune-ups? Can he overcome the size? But it's not just the size. If it was only the size, I'd say, yeah, he's got a good shot. And he might still have a good shot. But it's more than the size. Can he overcome the skill levels? Can he overcome the expertise in those areas with the size? of gone that's the trick my friend that's the question my friend that's what makes this unbelievably intriguing because of that if it happens because with john jones you don't know i'm not knocking him 
I'm just giving you, I'm giving you yesterday's news, buddy. You know, I, it doesn't make me uh, Walter Winchell. You remember Walter Winchell? You're too young for that. <laughs> but he was a great newscaster. He brought you the news. I, I was going to well, say newscaster. I knew who he was. Yeah, yeah. He bring, he was famous. He brought you the news. I'm not him. I'm not bringing you anything you don't know already. That half of the deal with John Jones is to get John Jones to be in the ring, to actually know that he's going to be in the cage, that he's going, you know, that the fight's actually going to happen. So. If it does, hey, you and me will be watching. Maybe we'll be there. Maybe we'll go there with Rob. Let's go. You know? Yeah. Maybe we'll That's go there. That's a good one. When and is that one? March? Mar what's the date on that? Give me one second. Let me just double check the fight. Um, that would be a fun one to go to, if especially if it's in Vegas, which I imagine it will be. Um, looking down the list here, there's some great fights coming up. March 4th, T-Mobile. Oh, I'll be in Tokyo. Dang it. Oh. I'm running the Tokyo Marathon on March yeah. 5th. Yeah, well, Damn you're the heck. marathon, man. You are the marathon, man. La hey, listen, that's the last of the of majors. Your, you're taking care of your business. You're taking care of your obligations. And you're taking care of us here, um, keeping us in the winning side, uh, having your greatness as part of this show, that you're the greatest master marathoner in the world, um, 50 and over, you're the best. I know that there was, you one to tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm not just bragging about a friend. I'm just stating facts. You won in New York. You won to Boston. And um, you came in second in London where we, we're not sure yet. We're, we're still trying <laughs> to find that videotape of, of that guy, how he snuck in there a little bit. Did we're, he run the whole course? <laughs> we're, we're trying to figure that one out. We're, we're still, we still got people on that. Ken, I still got people on that. Still looking. I got a few sleuths out there that are still trying to figure that one out. But you, my friend, are the best. And you're going to Tokyo to basically defend those those titles. And yes. that's gonna be great. We we're gonna be yeah. with you in spirit. And um but if you were around that would have been a fight. I might wind up working it because the great Charlie Monaghan who, who directs and produces all those uh, UFC fights and does a great job for ESPN doing that uh, and for UFC doing it, uh, he, he may have me out there working that fight. I know I'm working a fight coming up in Bristol. Um, I know there's a fight coming up in Bristol, Connecticut. Uh, February, I think it's February 11th, Ken. I don't know if it's on the calendar, but I... I I know that. Yeah, that's that's a hell of a fight. That's Makachev and Volkanovski. That one's oh, from wow. uh, Perth, Australia. Wow. Um, I know I'm going to be up in Bristol, so I guess they got me up in the studio um, doing something for that. Um, I know they're not flying me to to Australia for that. I'm not allowed in Australia anymore, anyway. You know, I would never, I would never get in the country. You know, because ever since that time I did that ESPN show over there with uh, Pacquiao and John Horn, and, and I called that show, right? Um, after the fight, I said, what was the truth? I said, John Horn didn't win this fight. You know, Australian fighter outdoors in a rugby stadium, 50,000 Aussies, you know, out there. And I love the Aussies, you know, their country, their outdoorsmen, their, their sportsmen. But they weren't real happy that I said their guy didn't win, that, you know, they robbed Pacquiao. And then um, John Horn and his people later on, because there was talk about me going over there for the rematch to cover it while I was still working at that time doing that stuff, which is no longer the case. But... I was, so they were talking about me going over there. John Horn and his manager said, oh, we already talked to immigration. We're not allowing them in. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> I've been thrown out of, listen, I've been thrown out of better places, but I've never been thrown out of a bigger place than, um, than Australia. That I have to admit. I've never been thrown out of a bigger place. But I still love the Aussies. And you know what? I got vindicated because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, he didn't beat Pacquiao. Truth is truth. And at the end of the day, he got his title. He made some money. And then they fed him to the Lions. And they put him in, you know, Big Bob, Big Bob, you know, fed him to the Lions. 
and he put him in with his next guy that he wanted to replace Pacquiao. That guy's name was Terrence Crawford. He put him in with him to get Terrence his first title, and Terrence destroyed him. And, you know, and the rest is history, as they say, right? Yep, the rest, that's it. The rest is, the rest is history. But, um, you know, I love the Aussies out there. Yep. I love my I love my granddaughter. She's waving to me from the door. You know what that means? <laughs> well, she's that just means, in time. <laughs> that means that it's time to end this. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> that, there's no better way. You don't need a producer. You don't need yep. a producer to say, "Okay, that's it. Let's go." That's you know. <laughs> Uh, you, you say less. Guys, thanks everyone for being with us. Teddy, thanks for the thorough breakdown. Making uh, lemonade out of lemons. Not a lot to talk about, but you made it entertaining and interesting. I appreciate you as always. I'm sure the fans do as well. Guys, thanks everyone for being with us. Please like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. It helps us a lot. We appreciate you whether you subscribe or not. Thanks for being with us.